Ah, there we go. Okay. So what I'm going to tell you about today, um, food and fuel. So I'm the director of food and fuel for the 21st century at UC San Diego. And so I suppose your first question is, why are we talking about food and fuel together? All right. In, in, first of all, they're, they're the same thing. I mean, you can define them chemically, right? They're both chemical energy, the energy in the substance you can use to do work. Okay, we can eat a pizza, I can get on a bike and I can ride 20 miles, or I could put a gallon of gas in my car and I could drive 20 miles. And in fact, we interchange them quite a bit. We take corn, actually about 40% of our corn crop, and we turn that into 13 billion gallons of ethanol that we blend with our fuel about 7% of our fuel, right? We also do the opposite. We take fuel and we turn it into food. Mainly we do that indirectly, right? Mainly we take that energy and we use that in industrial agriculture to produce the food. But I think we also do it directly sometimes because I'm convinced that Twinkies are a petroleum product. <laughs> I, I, I haven't found the recipe yet, but I'm pretty certain they are. Okay, so food and fuel are both the biological conversion of sunlight energy into chemical energy. Okay, so we take sunlight and water and CO2 and we convert that first into sugar and then we convert those sugars into carbohydrates and proteins and lipids. You'll recognize proteins and carbohydrates as food and you'll probably know that lipids are what become fuel. And in fact, importantly, all of petroleum is simply fossil algae, all right? and coal is fossil plants. So most of the energy that we use, all of the transportation energy we use, and all of the energy we use save nuclear power and a little bit of geothermal and wind and solar. So 85% of the energy we use comes from photosynthesis. It's just fossilized photosynthate. So they are the same thing. As I said though, we spend a fair amount of our energy to make food. And the way we do that is in industrial agriculture. And over the last 50 years, we've had enormous increases in agriculture. This was brought about by something called the Green Revolution, which started after World War II. And what that was is a series of breedings of plants to make them very productive. But that productivity came at a very high price. So that productivity did not come about because we increased the land we use. It didn't come about because we increased the number of farmers. It came about because we used tractors, and we used chemical fertilizer, and we used energy to produce that. Well, great. That worked very well. Agriculture worldwide, at least for most of the world, was very effective. So why is that a problem? That's a problem because here is a graph, one of my favorites, which shows petroleum production and utilization for the last 10,000 years. Here we are right here, 2013. We're at the top of that peak, and it's on its way down. And this, by the way, this, this 10,000 year scale is a bit arbitrary. Right? If I had gone back the entire length of time that it took us to accumulate all that fuel, that would be about 300 million years. You wouldn't even see that thing as a line. If I took the entire time humans were on this planet, maybe a million years, you also wouldn't see that line. So it's an arbitrary line, but it's, what it shows you is that we are going to burn through 300 million years of photosynthetic reserve in about 200 years. This is world population plotted against that same time frame. And what's really easy to see, here's the red line is world population, here's the blue line petroleum use. And so what's really clear from this is that what we've really done over the last 100 years is take fuel and turn it into large amounts of food and that allowed the population to get to 7 billion people today. So why that's a problem? That's a problem because that blue line is going down. And that's what we have to deal with, okay? Now, that blue line is petroleum. That's the cheap and easy stuff to get out of the ground, okay? We're not out of fossil fuels by any stretch of the imagination. We have a couple hundred years of those left. But what we only have about 30 or 40 years left is the cheap stuff. So what happened in agriculture recently, and this is simply a plot of the price of corn plotted against the price of oil. And as I said, energy, petroleum, is a key component of agriculture. And when it was really cheap, which for many years it was, you know, sort of historically for the last 40 years, it's been about $20 a barrel. Prior to that, it was about 8 bucks a barrel. 
So historically, it's been cheap up until about 2005 when it really started to go up. And many of you will recognize the spike there that hit in 2007, and then the economy crashed and it came back down. But as energy price goes up, it becomes a big component of food, and now food and fuel are linked. Their prices are linked. Since we've used up all the cheap stuff, the real problem for us is not, what am I going to do when gasoline hits five bucks a gallon? The real problem is, what am I going to do when food goes up? Now, some people will tell you that, wait a minute, I heard on the news that this new fracking technology is going to make the US energy independent really soon. That is not true, right? Fracking is old technology. Fracking is 50 years old technology. What happened was that in 2007, when the price of a barrel of oil went above 100 bucks a barrel, we could now use this very expensive technology. But just to show you how crazy it's become in this country, here is a picture. This is a satellite view of North America zooming in on North Dakota. And here's this enormous city out here in Northwest North Dakota where nobody lives. If you were to blow that out in North America, that would be the size of San Francisco. What is that? Here's an overlay map of all of the gas in red and oil wells in North Dakota. That is fracking central. What that is is the natural gas that is being flared off of all these wells, right? That's what fracking has done. This is a crazy addiction, right? This is, this, is, this is not Charlie Sheen addiction. This is Lindsay Lohan addiction, <laughs> all right? And, and I think we seriously need intervention to address this. Many of you may know that we hit a very sad milestone yesterday, which was we finally passed 400 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. And that is not something that is good for this planet. OK, so but what I'm going to tell you about is not just all the depressing stuff. I'm going to tell you about that I think we have an opportunity to apply some technology and maybe at least reduce the pain and suffering of this a little bit and maybe come up with a good solution. And that is algae. So why do we think of algae for, doing, for making any bioproduct, energy or food or anything else that we want to make? First and foremost is scalability. In this country, we use 300 billion gallons of fuel, of petroleum, every year. So you have to be able to go to an enormous scale if you're going to have an impact. Obviously, it's got to be productive. It's not going to do us any good to take all our land and turn it into to fuel farms. It better be sustainable, which means we can't be making energy if we're using up all of our fresh water or all of our phosphate. And then the last thing I want to tell you about is this enormous genetic diversity in algae that I think will give us an opportunity to do some really clever things in the future. So how does the process work? This is, this is the, the way it's done in my uh, lab at UCSD. We grow up algae. We concentrate that algae. We separate it into the protein components and to the lipid components. And then we take those lipids, and that crude algae oil can go directly to an existing refinery and produce drop-in fuels. It can produce gasoline or jet or diesel. A company that I'm a founder of, I'll show you a picture of it in just a second, is called Sapphire Energy. They have a demonstration facility down in New Mexico. And they are shipping their oil to Tesoro Refinery. Why does it work? It works because that's what petroleum is. It's simply ancient algae oil. So that part works really well. And in fact, they've made fungible fuels. Sapphire has driven their little car. They call it the Algeus. Some people call it the Algesus <laughs> because they believe it's our savior, but it's not. It's the Algeus. And that works very well. You can put in, you can put in diesel or gasoline made from algae. Um, they've also flown um, a couple now of flights on commercial liners. And another one of our competitors named Solazyme, they made biodiesel and the Navy last summer right out here in San Diego. Uh, drove destroyers and amphibious aircraft. So these things work. So what's the problem with it? The problem with it is cost, right? Right now, the best guess, maybe $200, $230 a barrel. But we think even with an optimistic view, we can probably get it down to 80 bucks a barrel. But we're never going to get it back down to that $20 or $10 a barrel. So scale, we can go to scale. So you can get to agricultural scale, and that can get economies of scale. But no matter what, we cannot make energy cheap again. We cannot get it back to its pre-2007 pre levels. Okay? This is the Sapphire facility. That's a third of a mile by one mile, and it's under full production. So does that just mean that the world's out of luck? Tough luck? You were born at the wrong time? You know, energy's just going to be expensive, and you're not going to eat? 
You know, what, what some of you may know is that the problems in the Middle East, you know, the Arab Spring, has very little to do with democracy and has a lot to do with the cost of food. Specifically in Egypt, when the price of bread went up and the government no longer subsidized it, then people threw the government out. But this is a problem worldwide. It's not a problem in this country because we only spend about 7 or 8% of our income on food. So the fact that it's gone up 30% in the last two years, okay, now we spend 9%. But if you lived in Egypt, and if you're one of the other 2 billion people on the planet who spend 50 or 60% of your income, that's a big deal. So what can we do? Algae has unprecedented diversity, and it's very photosynthetically productive, almost twice what terrestrial crops are. So we have an ability to, to turn this into food, to turn it into fuel, and we also have an ability to turn it into medicine. And the reason they have that happy little pig there is because we expressed a protein in algae from colostrum. The protein happens to be called MAA. And when you eat it, it stimulates mucus production in your gut and gives you protection from bacterial infections. So we put this into animal trials funded by the Gates Foundation. And just last month, we determined that these little guys, when inoculated with bacteria, no longer got diarrhea. So that's good for the pigs, but this could be great for the world because now we have a way to produce very cheaply a, a protein with inside that guy that can hopefully get rid of diarrhea in the third world. And many of you will know that that's the number one cause of child death on the planet. It's not malaria, it's not starvation, it's dehydration. Okay, so I'm just gonna leave you with the last couple thoughts. This is something that we just made in our lab two weeks ago, rainbow-colored algae. How is rainbow-colored algae gonna change the world? Well, number one, if they were only a little bigger, I think we could sell them in Kmart, right? <laughs> but what it really tells you is with molecular genetics and breeding, I believe we can make almost anything now, right? There has been such an explosion in science over the last 10 years. I've been doing this for 25 years, and today, a high school student in my lab does as much in, in a three-week internship that I did 25 years ago when I got my PhD. So that explosion of science is going to allow us the opportunity to do stuff with this that will allow us to really, I think, change the world. Change the world in a positive way, meaning that, you know, are, are we going to go? Will there be algae ponds to cover the world? Probably not. But I think if we use really clever science, that we will certainly be able to use this resource to produce food, to produce medicine, and maybe to produce energy so that at least we can keep the planet going at its present rate for a few more years. So thank you very much for your time, and I'll leave it with just my website, and you can look us up there if you'd like. Thank you.